from machine learning to machine learning from a generative art tracks to Richard Meadows talking about integrating TensorFlow or using TensorFlow on embedded Rust, which I also find a very interesting subject because we've been talking so much about integrating Rust with other stuff over the whole morning in the chat and during the talks. So here's a talk that applies it. Give it a go, Richard. OK, so uh, my name is Richard Meadows. And I'm going to be talking about using the TensorFlow framework in embedded Rust. So uh, TensorFlow is a machine learning framework. Uh, so well, what is machine learning? Uh, so firstly, machine learning is about transferring, uh, transforming some input data into some useful outputs. Uh, this is something we do all the time when we're programming, uh, so conditional statements, if statements. Um, but in this case, we're going to use a model to make the transformation rather than handcrafted code. So what's more, uh, this model is created using an algorithm, uh, usually based on training data. Uh, because it's generated computationally, uh, the model could be much more complex than anything we could practically create by hand. And uh, this enables new applications. So uh, a little bit about TensorFlow. Um, you can think of TensorFlow as a toolbox in machine learning. It gives you many of the tools you need. Um, there are other frameworks. Um, but TensorFlow is one of the most popular, and that gives it the advantage of good documentation and uh, a big community. Uh, it also has support for embedded platforms, uh, which is important for us. OK, uh, so this slide uh, is the simplest drawing of machine learning uh, I could come up with. Um, so at the top, there's training, uh, which is where we create the model. Uh, the model then goes down the arrow and the model is used for inference. So inference is just a name for the process of creating uh, outputs from the input data. Uh, so this drawing doesn't quite cover all possible forms of machine learning. There's also reinforcement learning and other schemes with feedback. Um, but this is good enough for today. Um, and something else about this talk. So we're only going to cover inference. Uh, training is something that would typically happen on a um, on a PC or a server with lots of uh, compute resources, maybe also a GPU. Um, and you can do this in Python, Java, C++, uh, Rust, of course. Um, but either way, at the end of training, you get the model. Um, there is one really important part of training called quantization. And we'll make a small exception to talk about that later. Uh, it's also worth, at this point, defining the term uh, edge machine learning. Uh, you see as the acronym EDGE ML. Uh, so this is where one or other of these steps happens physically close to the input data. Um, so that's usually a sensor or a microphone. And uh, that means it's happening on an embedded platform. OK, so uh, more details about using TensorFlow or microcontrollers. Uh, so this is uh, a subset of the overall TensorFlow project. And the official name is TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers. Uh, that's a bit of a handful. Uh, so I'm going to shorten it to TensorFlow Micro uh, for the rest of this talk. Uh, you may also see some of the other abbreviations there. Um, one of the good resources uh, to learn in this area is a book. Uh, so that's written by two of the contributors. Um, there's also some screencasts online relating to this book. And uh, all this material is a great place to learn more about training and quantization, uh, because we're not going to cover those in detail. OK, so, so far we know TensorFlow Micro is written in C++, and it runs on microcontrollers. So how do we go about making use of that in a Rust project? Um, so one of the features of Rust is that it can be application binary interface, so ABI compatible with C. Uh, so in simple terms, that means that we can configure things so we can call C functions from within our Rust. 
and it even works the other way around. We can call lost functions from within our C programs. So, uh, so once we have that power uh, to call C functions from our Rust code, uh, we can write what's called bindings. So these are sets of Rust functions um, that call corresponding C functions. And we can group and structure those Rust functions together so it looks like a regular Rust API. And that gives it a kind of form and structure we expect when we're using uh, a Rust API. And once this abstraction is built and tested, then we can, uh, we can use it without really worrying that there's actually C under there. Um, so it's important not to forget entirely, um, but this is a good enough abstraction and it can take us a long way. Okay, so uh, to support different platforms, TensorFlow comes in several flavors. Uh, so there's uh, three uh, I've got on this slide. And uh, this is about the code that's running our inference step. And um, the three types differ on the platform that they're intended to run on. And for each one, there's a set of Rust bindings. So these are the Rust functions that have been written to the core the C functions in the TensorFlow project. And um, on the right-hand column there, there's a list of links to the relevant crates on crates.io. And um, for running on microcontrollers particularly, um, we're looking for a crate that doesn't use the Rust standard library. And so only the bottom line on this chart um, has that property. Um, so this is useful for microcontrollers, and it's also useful for other platforms that traditionally haven't had the standard library or where it's useful to save the space of not having the standard library in your uh, binary. Um, so WASM is a good example of that. Um, there is a Rust special interest group within the TensorFlow projects, and that's primarily concerned around uh, the top line on the, on the chart there. Um, and the Rust bindings there are sort of semi-official um, uh, Google doesn't give them full support, but, uh, but they are developed, particularly by some Google employees. Uh, the other interesting thing to note here is that TensorFlow Lite, and below it, TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers, uh, these have their own model format. Um, so this is a way of uh, yeah, writing the model uh, as, a, as a flat file format, and we're going to encounter that in a few minutes. Okay, so what have we seen so far? Um, so the last few slides have been about machine learning, uh, about TensorFlow, and how we can run inference on microcontrollers. Um, so the next few slides are going to be about using all of this in a real life Rust project. So um, we're going to go for typical Rust projects where we use Cargo. Um, so Cargo is our build system. And we add, uh, add the bindings crate to Cargo in the usual way, uh, which is by adding it to our cargo.toml file. And uh, you can find, obviously, details about the crate on crates.io. Um, and the really neat thing here is that this works out when we're cross-compiling as well, uh, particularly for ARM Cortex. is probably the most commonly, uh, commonly used cross-compiling target. And, um, the only difference to a normal Rust crate is that we need to have, uh, in this case, a C++ compiler behind the scenes. Um, so, um, yeah, the Rust, uh, the Rust ecosystem here is actually doing some great things. Um, there is one open issue. I think that's been actively worked on. Um, but for the moment, it does need a nightly build flag. Um, it's because we use some of the same crates on both on the host side of the build system and on the targets. Um, which, Cardiff, uh, which Cargo doesn't support by default. Okay, uh, so now we're going to get onto the code. So in this example, we're going to work towards performing inference. Um, so we finish the training step um, by exporting the model into a flat binary file. And this is the file here, um, microspeech.tflight. Um, to skip the training step, we can use one of the example models from the TensorFlow projects, and in fact, this is one of those. So we want to get the, um, the bytes from our model file, obviously, into our program. 
and the include bytes macro uh, does exactly that. Um, on the next step, um, TensorFlow has some model validation and passing functions, and uh, we run them like this. So there's two other things that we need to start doing inference, um, and I'm going to skip over them here, uh, but I promise they're just one or two lines of code. Um, so we need something for looking up the DSP operations that are used as part of the, uh, as part of the inference process. Um, there's a default option is to use all the possible DSP operations supported by TensorFlow, um, but the downside of that for microcontrollers is that it uses lots of flash memory. Um, so we can get around that by specifying only the operations we need at this stage. Uh, the second thing uh, we need here is um, TensorFlow internally uses, has its own uh, stack or stack or heap memory that it uses and it allocates to its own memory allocator. Um, so we need to provide some memory uh, for that. Okay. So once we've got all those three things, the model, the op resolver, and the tensor arena, uh, we can put them together to make an interpreter. OK. Um, so at this point, we actually need to come back to um, what a tensor is. So um, in mathematics, tensor, tensor is used for various things. Uh, I'm not going to explain that here. Um, but here we can think of the tensor as just being a, an n-dimensional array of data. Um, and for putting it into the model, actually, we needs to be a flat, uh, flat array. And uh, there are some other methods you can call on the interpreter to find out what the, what the dimensionality should be, uh, which is fixed by the model. Um, but in this case, we has to be flattened down, and we pass it as a slice. And once that's done, um, we're almost there. Um, so the invoke method actually runs the uh, model. And this is what takes the time normally. So this is quite processor intensive. And then after that, we can get the output tensor. So that's pretty much all there is to it. Um, if you want to see all this, uh, this code in an example, then uh, in the TF micro crates, it's, uh, it's one of the tests. Uh, so you can see all this code to making a full program. OK, so now it's time for a quick demo. Um, so, so hopefully what you can see uh, is a uh, STM32 development board. And uh, this is running uh, one of the examples. And the, um, the output from the model, the output tensor, in this case, the dimensionality is uh, 1 by 4. Um, so there's four output values, and these are being plotted on a bar graph uh, on the screen. Um, so you may also get audio from this, so hopefully. It's uh, someone saying the word no uh, a couple of times. And um, if the model detects that word as a keyword detection, uh, then the bar will go over a threshold, I think 220. And the bar changes color to signify the, the phrase that's being detected. So I'm just going to play the video. No. No. And just once more. No. No. OK. Um, so. Uh, this model probably isn't the, um, you know, it's probably not the greatest model. Yeah, it's probably not the most robust, but it does work at a superficial level. And um, so there we go. Um, one interesting thing to note here is that the output data is, uh, is 8 bit integers. So it's over an unsigned int. So the possible values are between 0 and 255. Um, so this is because the, because the model has been quantized. Um, so normally doing training, the model weights and the inputs and outputs are normally floating point values. Um, but at the end of the training step, uh, you can use quantization to reduce this to 8 bits operations. Um, and at the same time, you keep track to make sure 
uh, that the accuracy of the model isn't being degraded too much. Um, so when generating models for microcontrollers, um, this is really important because it uh, significantly increases the execution speed. Um, so you should probably you should do this uh, when creating a model for microcontrollers unless you're specifically trying something else. Okay, back to the slides. Okay, so let's step back a bit um, and talk about the crates uh, that we've used to do this. So um, this is an open source crate written by myself and Kevin Hill. And um, it's on crates.io. It's uh, documented. It's got tests. It's got CI. Um, it's partially checked against the Rust API guidelines. Um, so probably could do with a little more work there, but um, it's pretty usable and it follows the usual Rust patterns that we expect. Okay, um, so challenges around maintaining a crate like this. Um, so the TensorFlow project as a whole uh, gets about 500 commits a week. Um, so that's a pretty big uh, velocity of change. Um, the TensorFlow micro subsets uh, is not so bad. Um, but still, there's several people working full time on this, and uh, the C API does change uh, fairly regularly. Um, however, the good thing about Rust bindings is they give us some flexibility. And uh, actually, for some of the recent changes, we've been able to um, refactor for the changes in the C API, um, but the Rust API remains unchanged. OK, um, so why do this in Rust? Um, so um, some of the benefits of Rust here is really the tooling. Uh, so not the language, but actually the, the ecosystems of tools like Cargo, uh, the CC crates, and BindGen um, that really help us out. So without Cargo, uh, integrating build systems from a microcontroller vendor with TensorFlow's own uh, can be quite a task. And, uh, there's actually various development boards uh, that advertise having a TensorFlow build system and hardwares and hardware examples. And they advertise this as a feature when selling real hardware. And of course, if you're trying to run TensorFlow, this, this is worth uh, paying a small premium for. Um, however, with Cargo, um, this is just a standard, uh, here we have a standard build system and this all comes for free. Um, so the Rust system, the Rust ecosystem gives us this great build tooling, and we can easily add TensorFlow to an existing project. Um, it also allows us very easily to build for multiple targets. Uh, so we can use the same crate for testing on, uh, on a desktop PC, and then exactly the same code then gets cross-compiled and runs on a microcontroller. Um, however, to achieve this kind of composability uh, of the library, the language also plays a role. Um, so if the language allows memory aliasing, then we actually have to manually evaluate the memory usage of all the different component parts in order to make sure we're building a bug-free program. However, with a memory-safe language like Rust, we can delegate this task to the compiler, um, trusting it to error if there's a mistake. OK, so time for some codes. OK, so if you remember that function a few slides ago where we created the micro interpreter out of the three component parts, uh, so the model, the op resolver, and the tensor arena. So here it is as a C function definition uh, taken out of the TensorFlow project. And um, OK, that's pretty big comments. Uh, I'm just going to summarize it. So it says that the lifetime of all these things uh, must be at least as long as uh, the lifetime of the interpreter object. Uh, and then it gives you some advice for doing this in a typical project. So um, this, if you've been programming in a language with manual memory management for a while, then you can understand this and you can do this. Um, but um, so we want to make things more accessible. And also in the real world, things change. And um, 
you need to keep you would need to keep uh, keep checking this invariant for all the time your project changes, um, and that's not so great. Um, but what Rust allows us to do is um, is model uh, model this constraint actually in the language um, as lifetime annotations. So here's some Rust. So this is a pretty big function definition. Um, some moderately advanced Rust going on here. Um, I'm just going to give you a few seconds to read it. Okay. So this function says something like, um, so we're going to implement the microinterpreter with its lifetime A. And then the function is public function new. And it has the lifetime M, which exceeds lifetime A. And the lifetime T, which exceeds lifetime A. And uh, some generic types. Then when we uh, pass the model into the function, we tell the Rust compiler that we're borrowing the model for the lifetime M, which from the previous line, we know exceeds the lifetime of the microinterpreter. So actually, we've now enforced that constraint in software. And that means that when we do a CI build, um, this constraint gets checked. And that's really useful. Um, there's an extra, um, some more advanced Rust going on at the bottom here, where the tensor arena can either be mutably borrowed uh, from the stack or it can come from the heap. So um, if you're running a larger microcontroller project, uh, you might have an allocator for your heap. And uh, in this case, you can pass either here. Yeah. OK. So quick summary. So we can make use of TensorFlow, a light for microcontrollers uh, in Rust. Um, through building and sharing Rust binaries, we can make use of TensorFlow and many other um, big C and C++ code bases um, that are useful for embedded projects. Uh, Rust gives us some great advantages with consistent build tooling uh, combined with a memory safe language. And we can easily compose a program with multiple complex libraries uh, without introducing new bugs. Um, the Rust language also helps maintenance because we can make sure we're keeping up these invariants um, with the compiler, and the compiler can check this in continuous integration. OK, great. So that's the end of the slides. Um, I'm happy to take a few questions. Um, but otherwise, uh, thank you for listening. Yeah, thank you for the talk. And uh, I'm looking, this talk also sparked a lot of conversation in the speaker's room. Uh -huh. And uh, I'll have to see how many of those questions are actually not asking other people questions. <laughs> um. Ah, here, question for Richard Meadows. Uh -huh. What kind of data applications do you recommend using ML on microcontrollers for? So, um, so the models that we that I demoed here are all um, so they're all kind of linear models. So what that means is that the, the input data goes through a series of transformations, so a series of uh, DSP operations. Um, and they, they form a kind of linear graph to get to the output. Um, so this is good for things like uh, classifiers. So um, we demoed here a speech classifier. Um, it can also be used uh, some very basic image classification is possible. Um, and also things like classifying uh, accelerometer movements, so uh, gesture detection. Um, I think um, there are other more advanced forms of um, uh, of machine learning here we, that aren't supported. Um, so there's uh, there's long long term, short term memory, and other kind of recursive structures that TensorFlow Micro doesn't yet support. Um, so we can't do everything. Um, so I think 
Yeah, in short, we can do classification, um, but I think big sort of large data processing is, is not yet uh, ready for microcontrollers. Thank you. I, unless someone quickly posts a question, I have seen no other questions to you. But as I said, a lot of discussion that you can hop into. And yeah. thank you for that talk. Oh, here's, here's one question. Um, how limited is uh, TF Lite for microcontrollers feature-wise compared to the regular TF Lite, which is already limited compared to the regular TensorFlow? Okay, yeah, so I think part of that is what we were just talking about, that, uh, that things like the recursive networks and long-term short-term memory isn't yet supported in uh, TensorFlow Lite. Um, my understanding is that TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers supports many of the, uh, many of the operations that are supported in Lite. So I think uh, it's definitely a subset of the overall TensorFlow project, um, but many of the features are now trickling down. Thank you. OK, then with that, I'd leave you into the discussion. And we'll see us after the break. <laughs>